In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Both you may stand if you're able for our opening hymn. to God our Father and ask him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. We confess that we are born in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We deserve your eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <laughs> I ask each of you in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you confess that you have sinned and do you repent of your sins? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins and do you desire forgiveness in his name? And do you intend with the help of the Holy Spirit to live as in God's presence and to strive daily to lead a holy life even as Christ has made you holy? As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. On behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive the sins of all of you who repent and believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 37, which we say together responsibly. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. 
For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it, only, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them, because they take refuge in him. He is still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray that we love our enemies. We pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that your Son loved us even when we were enemies and that he prayed for those who killed him. Teach us to be merciful like you, and do good to all people, even those who do us harm. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now have our readings. Our first reading for this morning is taken uh, from the seventh Sunday after Epiphany is taken from Genesis 45 verses 3 to 11 and 15. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you and your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine 
are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 33 to 38 and 42 to 50, the resurrection body. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What, with what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives it his own, its own body. So will it be the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man Adam becomes a living being, the last Adam a living, life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And, is, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are, are of heaven. And just as we have been born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you're able, please rise for the Gospel. The Gospel comes from Luke 6, 27 to 38. Love your enemies, be merciful like God. Jesus said, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Praise, pray for those who ill-treat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn them, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's together confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. This morning we continue our sermon series looking at the book of Revelation. And today we come to chapter 4. So you're welcome to, to follow along in chapter 4 in your Bibles if you've got them or on your devices as well. So this, this chapter 4 could be described as the, the second part of the letter that reveals what's happening in heaven as the worshipping church on earth is persecuted and faces attacks against the gospel. So so far through Revelation 1, 2 and 3, last week we heard about the seven churches that John writes to where he shares the words of Jesus, giving the churches encouragements, giving them warnings and then the hope of victory. And these churches were facing persecution in, on many different fronts, um, from the Roman Empire, from within as well with false teaching, and also from the the Jewish communities too. And so in chapter 4, John is revealed to him as this picture of heavenly worship. 
What we discover is God's reality in the face of evil, that which opposes God. So it's a letter to encourage Christians to remain firm in their faith. So let's get into to chapter 4 of Revelation. It starts off by saying, where John is having this revelation, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So this loud voice, which we, we heard about in the, the opening chapter, speaks to, to John, the voice of Jesus. Now it's important to remember that, that what is revealed to John is like he's standing on, on top of like the Sydney Centre Point Tower, something similar, even our, our church bell tower, you could say. So that gives you this 360 view. And what's revealed and recorded by John is him telling us what he sees as he has this this sweeping view. So if we're up on the bell tower, we might say, then I saw, I looked out and I saw a boat on the river. Then I saw cars driving up the main street. Then I saw a person walk into the church car park. All these things as you sweep around to see the view of Loxton. And so the first of what John sees is a worship scene. He sees worship in heaven and God on his throne. This is the, the centre to everything else that will, he will see and what he will record in the following chapters. God on his throne is at the centre. And so it says in verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Now in that ancient world, in particular for the Romans, gems, precious stones, were real signs of authority and power. And often the, the emperor's robe and insignia had gems in them. If we remember from the first couple of chapters, emperors were often depicted as saviour figures, saviours of the people. That's important as God sits on his throne with these, these gems. God is the saviour not the Roman Empire. Then we have this, this rainbow that's encircling this throne and it, it takes our minds back to Genesis and Noah, the flood, where God makes a promise to his people, but it's also back in Ezekiel 2, where there's this, where it's a God telling his people that he is faithful, that there's this everlasting covenant that he's made with them. The one who sits on the throne in power and splendour is the faithful Saviour God. And then surrounding this throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. So who are these 24 elders? Well, it's interesting that the Roman emperors were believed to have what were called 12 lictors. They were like bodyguards or personal assistants. It's said that Emperor Domitian doubled his number to 24, having 24 people surrounded around his throne as such, unwittingly copying God, who is the, the true emperor, as Revelation describes to us. But it's more likely that these 24 elders represent the whole people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the church, making 24. And so these elders, these people who represent the whole people of God, are dressed in white and have gold crowns. Images of that these people have been made holy by Christ and have conquered evil alongside of or through the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we get this image of Jesus being the Lamb in the next chapter. But the crown that these elders wore was a symbol of honour in the ancient world. Not just for royalty, but those honoured for their service. So the people of God are honoured around the throne of God. And in front of the throne are seven lamps or torches or fire, the seven spirits of God. This is a picture for the Holy Spirit who was perfect. Remember, number seven is the number of perfection. 
relating back to God's creation. He created in seven days, completeness, wholeness. And so the Holy Spirit is perfect in truth and is present with his church. The lightning and the thunder, the awesome display on show, all point to one thing, and that is that the triune God is present. Worship him. John goes on to say, Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Now the sea has many different meanings and images in the Bible and in Revelation. But perhaps here it's believed that this is an image of the Red Sea. Go back to Exodus story where the people passed through the Red Sea when they were being pursued by the Egyptians. When God was leading his people out of slavery from Egypt on towards a journey to the promised land. And they had to pass to the Red Sea. It's often a symbol of redemption and salvation for God's people. But we also know that in Solomon's grand temple that he built, he had a replica of the Red Sea within it. And what John sees is a crystal sea. In Exodus 15 verse 8, there's the song of Moses when they passed through the Red Sea and they sang praise to God. It said, by the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging sea waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. And so ancient rabbis taught that the part of Red Sea that was congealed was like this glass vessel, this crystal ocean that the people passed through. And so as they passed through, what they saw was this glass sea on either side. And so it continues to say that the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So you picture these, these living creatures, we're, we're given quite a sight, really. And these living creatures, these four living creatures, form the throne of God. We just imagine like a beautifully carved wooden throne in the ancient world that often had animals making up part of the legs of the throne and depicted images of animals in the carving. Here, in this vision, the living animals form God's throne. And these living animals will then worship the Lamb Jesus Christ in the next chapter. But these animals with the six wings, they're reminiscent of Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1, where he describes the almighty presence of God. He has this vision and he has these animals as well, these four living creatures. And these animals have lots of eyes, meaning they're ever aware. They're always alert to the one who sits on the throne, always ready to do his will. But these four creatures also represent the whole of creation. The animals, the hills, the sea, the rivers, the stars. Each of these animals live in these different places, representing God's creation. And so all of creation and the whole people of God, the, the 24 elders, are before this throne of God, encircled around and part of the throne. And what John sees is that whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, the whole people of God, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So all of creation worships and praises the Creator. And all that we see points to the Creator God. And for that reason, they worship Him day and night without ceasing. It's a wonderful image to take in. All of creation worshipping God. 
And the 24 elders, the whole people of God, they respond to creation's worship cry of holy, holy, holy by falling to the ground in worship around the throne of God. And they cast their crowns before God in an act of homage and submission because only God is worthy of their praise. In worship, we are before the throne of God. We are brought into the presence of God and with creation, we sing our praises to God. There is something amazing that's taking place here and we we don't see it with our eyes, but what we see, but what God sees rather, is his creation and his people, us, before his throne. You are before God's throne in worship even if you can't see it with your own eyes. And maybe if we were to take the images of Revelation to, to heart and what's, what's happening here in heaven as, as earth worships, we might not be consumed by minor things, but would be just in awe of God's holiness. Because what Revelation teaches us is that worship is about God. Not what we want to get out of it. That's what makes this challenging for us. Because it may ask us, have you ever abstained from going to worship or felt uncomfortable or angry because, well, the band is playing. On the other hand, the organ's playing. Or the pastor isn't robed, or the pastor's on holidays, or worship isn't a time that suits you, or it isn't in a church building, or we don't have a specific liturgy, or because something's been moved, or you just don't agree with something in general. Because what we are really saying is my needs are more important than God. And that becomes a worship issue. An idolatry issue. That means something is more important in your life than God. Because worship isn't about you or me and satisfying (coughs) our needs. It's not about the songs we speak, the liturgy we speak when we stand or sit, if we have communion at the rail or standing along the front here, if we're in a building or not. I'm not saying that we don't treat worship with the honour and glory that God deserves because we should. Rather, I'm talking about when pride, selfishness, anger become a barrier to the real purpose of worship. And that's meeting around the throne of God and throwing ourselves before him in praise. That's the picture that Revelation gives us. So ask, what does God see from his throne in heaven? When Christians have arguments about the style of worship, or the buildings, or the people, the pastor. See, Revelation reminds us that there is a purpose to our worship. It's before the throne of God, with all of creation. With all of God's people from all time, where we humble ourselves and we submit to him. Now, this doesn't mean that our worship here on earth is to be boring or onerous. But we need to remember that it isn't a human performance either. It's God meeting us with his love and his grace, feeding us, sustaining us for this life. It's being in a safe place, a sanctuary, to remember who we truly are. And that is his beloved people to have a place of honour around his throne. We worship not because we have to, but because we can and we want to. That's what leads us before the throne of God, because of who he is and because of his invitation. And so we come to hear his word, we come to receive his forgiveness again and again, to share in his holy meal, to spend time in prayer, To be in his presence. And we do what humans do when they're filled with joy. They sing together. So when we meet together, we confess that God 
is the one true God. And we are the people, his people. We put aside all other objects of worship, even our own sinful emotions, and we repent and we receive his forgiveness. And we do this as community. Because God's worship is corporate. Yes, we can worship God any time and by ourselves, but worshipping as a, as a community is how God worships. It's God's vision for worship. It's together we find strength in the face of trials and hardships in our face. In our faith, sorry. Where we're fueled for this week and the week ahead to be his people in a world that may reject us. So may we find encouragement from Revelation 4 and from the rest of the journey that's ahead of us. And remember that there is more to what is just happening here in this building on a Sunday morning. May we also be challenged by this heavenly worship scene and grow an understanding of what God's vision for worship is. May we also find hope in the hardship we might face as a church and know that God is in control. He is on his throne. And all of heaven and the church on earth gathers around his throne to worship him. As creation cries out, holy, 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 his church responds by falling before him in praise and worship, humbling themselves, submitting to him, giving their hearts and lives to him. So my friends, may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Friends, let's sing our next hymn. <coughs>
What can I offer to the Lord for all of his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. As people who have received new life from the Spirit, let us pray in the name of our resurrected Lord Jesus. Almighty God, giver of all things, we give thanks for all your goodness. We bless you for the love you which has created us and which sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Saviour, through whom you have made known your will and grace. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and good people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness by lives that are wholly given to your service. We pray for your church that it may be a sign of forgiveness in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Make it perfect in love and in all good works and establish it in the faith delivered to the saints. Sanctify and unite your people in all the world that one holy church may bear witness to you, the creator and redeemer of all. We pray for those divided by hatred, asking that by forgiveness, broken relationships might be restored. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. We pray today for those whose poverty has reduced them to begging. Work in our hearts, Heavenly Father, that we may see their need before they need to ask for it. We ask for the gift of generosity, that the resources of the world may be shared by all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sanctify our homes with your presence and joy. Keep our children in the promises of their baptisms and enable their parents to rear them in a life of faith and devotion. We ask for your love and healing for families that are divided or alienated from one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honour, that we may lead a peaceful life of integrity. Grant health and favour favour to our leaders, local, state and national. Pray for magistrates and judges that they may temper justice with due compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort with the grace of your Holy Spirit all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Have mercy on those who are dying that they may know the hope of the resurrection. Bring consolation to those who are mourning the loss of a dear one. Hear us now, Lord God, as we bring before you those people whom we know to be in need. Lord, we lift up to you, Glennis Albrecht, Pastor Darren Court, and Les Bergmeister. Lord, continue to sustain the Tongan community um, too, those here in Australia, away from their family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, teach us to give as we have received and to forgive as we have been forgiven. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. Amen.